Hello, this is welcome to my first series on reading, and I'm going to read Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. I found this book on a stoop in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and so I'm going to read it. Part 1, The Old Buccaneer. The Old Sea Dog at the Admiral Benbow. That's the title of the chapter. Now, let's begin. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Levesey, and the rest of these gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace 17 and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in, and the brown old seamen with the saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday, as he came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand borrow, a tall, strong, heavy, nut brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat his hands ragged and scarred with black broken nails and the saber cut across one cheek a dirty livid white i remember him looking round the cover and whistling to himself himself as he did so and then breaking out in that old sea song he sang so often afterwards fifteen men on a dead man's chest yo ho ho and a bottle of rum in the high, old, tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the cat stand bars. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of stick, like a hand spike that he carried. And when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly, like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, says he at length, and a pleasant city-ated song, Grog Shop. Much company, mate? My father told him no, very little company. The more was the pity. Well then, said he, this is the berth for me. Here you go, matey, he cried to the man who trundled the barrow. Bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want. And that head up there for to watch ships off. What you mought call me, you mought call me captain. Oh, I see what you're at there. And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. You can tell me when I've worked through that, says he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed, bad as his clothes were, and coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mass, but seemed like a mate or a skipper accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrel told us the mail had set him down the morning before at the Royal George that he acquired what inns there were along the coast. In hearings are well spoken of, I suppose, and described as lonely. Had chosen it from the others for his place of residence. And that was all we could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung round the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in the corner of the parlor next to the fire and drank rum and water very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to, only looked up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn. And we, and the people who came about our house, soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring man had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was the want of company of his own kind that made him ask this question, but at last we began to see he was 
it is serious to avoid them. When a seaman did put up at the Admiral Benbow, as now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol, he would look in at him through the curtain door before he entered the parlor, and he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there was no secret about the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver fourpenny on the first of every month if I would only keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg, and let him know the moment he appeared. Often enough, when the first of the month came round and I applied to him for my wage, he would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down, but before the week was out he was sure to think better of it. Bring me my four penny piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams, I nearly scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house, and the surf roar along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms, and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of creature who had never had but the one leg, and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. And altogether I prayed pretty dear for my monthly four penny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a deal more rum and water than his head would carry, and then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. But sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I heard the house shaking with yo ho 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 and a bottle of rum, all the neighbors joining in for dear life, with the fear of death upon them, and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these bits he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence all around. He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, or sometimes because none was put, and so he judged the company was not following his story nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were the frightened people, worst of all. Dreadful stories they were, about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea and the dry tortugas and wild deeds in places on the Spanish main. By his own account he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea and the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying the inn would be ruined, for people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back they rather liked it. It was a fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a tree, a true sea dog and a real all salt, and such like names, and saying there was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. So this is the first reading of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, Underbridge, New York Post published it. Um, not sorry, they didn't publish it. They're just um, re they're actually just sponsoring it. It's an old book I found. So. Uh, yeah, tell me what you think of it. Tell me, uh, uh, you can leave a comment down there on the YouTube. You can criticize. I'm always open to criticism. And I hope you enjoy and uh, subscribe to my channel. Bye.